And at first I asked you what you thought this looked like. And I think it looks like a fecal sac, which is the sac. That's the, the feces that, that nestlings in a bird nest make. They put, put all their poops in a little sac and the parents pick it up and fly out and drop it. And it goes splat on a leaf. Um, it's not a fecal sac. It's actually a spider type of spider called a bola spider um, that's trying to look like a fecal sac during the day because nothing wants to eat a fecal sac. But at night, it looks like a real spider. Uh, it hangs from a leaf and drops a single strand of silk with one sticky glob of glue at the end. <clears throat> you wouldn't think that's a good way to catch uh, very many, many prey items, uh, but they do. Moths fly in and get caught on that. They spin them around very quickly, wrap them up in silk, and then they have a nice, nice meal. Then they catch another moth, they spin it around, catch another moth, spin it around, have a nice meal. And when they get enough energy, they make a uh, an egg mass. It's full of, it's a silken egg mass and all the eggs are in the center there. And that's how they spend the winter. And if they find, if they, if they tracked enough moths to eat, then they make two or three egg masses to spend the winter. But the real question is why are moths flying into this one single target? Uh, well, it's not an accident. This spider is releasing the sex pheromone of particular species of moths. So all the moths that fly in and get stuck are males thinking she was a female moth, but she's actually a female spider. Uh, and I wanted to know what the species of moth was that uh, the spider was collecting at my house. Uh, so I unwrapped all of the, the uh, little bodies that she cut loose and found out it was the bronze cutworm. <clears throat> all right, I wanted to see what the type of moth was that the bola spider was catching in my yard. I unwrapped those little bodies and it was the bronze cutworm. And I've got bronze cutworm adults because I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars and I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars because I've got goldenrod, which is their primary host plant. I've got the dot lined white uh, moth, a beautiful little moth because I've got oak trees, primarily white oak trees. And because I don't rake the leaves away from underneath those, those trees. Uh, there is a dot lined white cocoon in this leaf litter. It's right there. You're never going to see that when you're raking leaves away. There it is enlarged. So, uh, you know, when you're raking leaves, keep in mind, you're raking away a lot of life forms. I have this beautiful moth, the evening primrose moth, because I planted evening primrose and the moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. And sometimes a lot of moths come. They're all stuffed in there. But <clears throat> it's another type of biodiversity I have on my property because I've got that particular plant. I've got the beautiful zebra swallowtail because we planted pawpaws. That's the host plant for the caterpillar of that, that, uh, that butterfly. So it would take me a long time to describe all the life forms that are now living on our property, primarily because we put the native plants back. Because acceptance is equivalent to giving up. <clears throat> and giving up is not an option. We cannot give up on nature because it is nature that keeps us alive on this planet. So we need a sixth stage. And I'm going to propose action. There really are things that we can do to, uh, to uh, decrease at least the loss of biodiversity. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves. Uh, you know, our national parks were established primarily because they were really pretty places. They were exquisitely beautiful. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do with expanding the national park system. And this is what he said about it. He said, the establishment of the National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So Teddy was patting himself on the back. Uh, as he should, um, and the value of natural beauty as a national asset and of the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenship. In other words, our parks were established because they were pretty places for us to play in. They were not established with the idea of conservation in mind. And it's probably why we only have 3.6% of the U.S. in national parks. Only 12% is federally protected. And if you care us, uh, compare us to other countries like Costa Rica, they have 20 some percent of their, their country in national parks. <clears throat> but people wonder, why aren't the parks and preserves that we have enough to sustain the biodiversity that we humans need? And it's a good question. There are actually several answers, but the, the most important one is that uh, our parks and preserves are too small. When you take a large area like this, a large habitat like this, and you shrink it down to a little habitat fragment, and that's an exaggeration. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why is that? Well, all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. <clears throat> if you're a large population like this large line here, 
or this top line, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, this bottom line here, often in those normal cycles, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat fragment and then you are gone. You're permanently gone unless you recolonize. And recolonizing is very difficult these days. Picture a box turtle crossing Route 95. It's just not going to happen. Studies all over the planet are telling us the same thing. And some of these studies are quite long, over 100 years in length. We have not preserved enough of the natural world that sustains us to sustain us into the future. We tend to use extinction as a metric of trouble, but I, I think that's not a good idea because that's like going to the doctor when you're already dead. It's a little late. Uh, I, I'm proposing defaunation. This is the reduction of the, the populations of what were once common species, the species that actually ran the ecosystems we depend on. So this is an example. This is the chestnut, the American chestnut. It was the dominant tree along the Appalachian crest from Maine all the way to Georgia until we brought in the chestnut blight. Now it's not extinct. There are a few sprouts coming up here and, here and there, but it's functionally extinct. It's no longer common enough to be performing the roles that it once performed. This is the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, just a few years ago, it used to be one of the most common bees in North America. Now, if you find one, it's a big deal because they're on the brink of extinction. So again, they're not extinct, but they're not performing their, their ecological roles anymore. Even the American beaver. You know, when, when uh, Europeans came to North America, beavers had established the hydrology of the entire country. Well, we trapped just about all of them out. They're not extinct either, and they're coming back in a few places. Of course, as soon as they act like a beaver, we trap them and, and take them someplace else. But the hydrology of the country is still permanently changed, uh, or at least changed until we let those beavers go again. So defaunation, the reduction in the abundance of species that run ecosystems, that's the real problem. It's local, it's everywhere, and we tend not to even notice. And we don't notice because of a phenomenon called shifting baseline. We tend to think that the way things were when we were kids is the way they've always been and the way they always should be. So if we are born into a world that's defaunated, we think that's normal. We think that's okay. None of us missed the passenger pigeon, which was the most numerous bird on the planet because it was extinct before any of us were born. So shifting baseline means that we're losing the biodiversity that sustains us without even noticing it. Edwin Way Teal decades ago said, we cannot make the world uninhabitable for other forms of life and have it habitable for ourselves. This is so logical. This is so common sense that we, we don't even seem to recognize it. So what are we gonna do? <clears throat> well, there's actually good news. The UN has noticed that we've got a biodiversity crisis. Yes, we've got climate change, but we also have a biodiversity crisis. And last year, they met in Montreal to talk about the biodiversity crisis, to make some resolutions. This is a headline that came out of that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We are negotiating whether or not we're going to protect the life forms that keep us on this planet. Well, I don't know what they concluded. Maybe they made some resolutions. It doesn't really matter because we always ignore the UN resolutions. Um, how about E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson from Harvard, the late Edward O. Wilson. Uh, extremely long career, over 60 years. One thing that was consistent throughout his career was his love of life on planet Earth and his efforts to save it. And he wanted to save it not because he loved it, but because he knew it was essential to our own survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. He said, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet, or it will disappear everywhere. And that includes humans. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save life on planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biology uh, biologist, that's uh, a great idea. We will just put half the Earth aside and all those things that are in trouble can be in that half. We humans can be in the other half and it'll be great. Problem is half of terrestrial earth is already some form of agriculture. I don't see us getting rid of that. <clears throat> We've got 8 billion people in all of our, our um, roadways and hardscape and airports and detritus in the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we realize E.O. Wilson's dream? I think we can. I really do think we can. But we need a new approach to conservation. We have to give up the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. 
in the same place at the same time. My message today is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. So we're not just going to practice conservation here. We're going to practice it here. We're going to practice it in our cities. But guess what? There is nothing to conserve there. So we have to put it back. We have to move beyond conservation into restoration. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. So fragmentation has been noted as the big problem. We've, we've uh, reduced the viable habitats uh, in this country to little teeny patches here and there, and they're all separated and isolated from each other. So what's been proposed is to build biological carters. You hear about pollinator pathways and all kinds of carters to connect those viable habitats with each other. Uh, to allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats. The problem with this is the populations within these habitats are still small. Yes, they can move back and forth, so we might not have inbreeding depression, but the populations are still small, so when they, when they fluctuate, they still are, are vulnerable to extinction. So I'm going to propose we go beyond uh, corridors. We're going to go, we're going to create viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. We're gonna fill in this no man's land here by putting the plants back. This is better, this is even better. So the lighter areas here would be where our big cities and, and farms are, but uh, we're gonna put the plants back where people live, where they work, where they play as much as we can. But guess what this area is? It's, it's our private property. And that means we need a new attitude about property rights. <clears throat> we all have this attitude that, that this idea that we can own a piece of the earth and do whatever we want with it because it's ours. You know, this is our kingdom. We're the kings. But we have to remember our yards are not like, like Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Some of you might, might really know that. <laughs> but what happens on our properties does not stay on our properties. That's the big difference. Each one of our properties is part of a local ecosystem. So whatever we do on our property impacts that entire ecosystem. Let's just look at the consequences of having a lot of lawn. Lawn's gonna determine whether uh, when it rains, the water infiltrates or whether it leaves as stormwater runoff. It's gonna determine how much we're polluting our local watershed. Are we adding nitrogen, phosphorus, herbicides, and insecticides, all that stuff we put on our lawns? in our local watershed. It's also gonna determine how much carbon we're adding to the atmosphere every time we mow this lawn. It's gonna determine how well we're treating those poor pollinators. You know, if we, if we make uh, lawns the way we're supposed to make them, it, it removes all of the resources that pollinators need. The plants we have in our yard, are gonna determine how much carbon we're actually sequestering, how much we're storing, we're pulling out of the atmosphere. That's what plants build their tissues out of, from the carbon from carbon dioxide, and then they pump the extra carbon into the ground through their root systems. And the plants we choose for our yards are going to determine how much we are storing. They're also going to determine whether we're harboring ecological tumors like these invasive uh, calorie pears or burning bush or barberry or the things that have escaped. They don't stay where we plant them. They escape and, and push out the native plants that are running our ecosystems all over the place. And how we landscape is going to determine whether we're using the plants that actually support a viable food web. Are they supporting the insects that transfer energy from those plants to other animals like birds? So in short, how we landscape, how much lawn we have is going to determine how well we are sustaining the life around us. How much life can earth sustain? What the carrying capacity is. And that is an awesome responsibility that homeowners have. It's an awesome responsibility that they don't know they have but it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity price crisis. There are millions of us out there. And if each one of us took care of the little piece of the earth that we could influence, uh, we would make a lot of headway. We've got to focus on private property because most of the country is, is privately owned. 78% of the entire lower 48 states is privately owned. 85% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. So if we don't practice conservation on private property, we are going to fail. And, and I'll remind you, we can't afford to fail. That makes property owners 
are now the hope and future of, of conservation. A very important role. Let's return to lawn. Now, I know in Manhattan, you don't have a whole lot of lawn, but it is a uh, it's a major feature of our landscapes around the country. So we have to talk about it. The last figure I saw was 44 million acres of lawn, which is an area bigger than all of New England combined, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Now, why do we do that? Well, it's a status symbol, very important status symbol. And we have to display our Halloween decorations. <laughs> but what if we cut the area of lawn in half? Um, let's say we've we've got 40 million acres of lawn. We'll make the math simple. We're going to cut that in half. That'll give us 20 million acres that we can restore right at home, which is enough to create what we're calling homegrown national park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge. Plus the Great Smoky Mountains, if you add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. Uh, it's real entity now. It's a small nonprofit, homegrownnationalpark.org. All you do is you go uh, to that website and register your property on the map. Uh, the location, and then the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of. If you actually own some property, you know, are you going to reduce the lawn? Are you going to plant an oak tree? Are you going to, or you could put a flower in a, a flower pot. That counts too. But then your little piece of your, your county is going to light up. You get to see who else in your county has joined Homegrown National Park. And of course, the the um, idea is to get the message that we are all responsible for the future of conservation to go viral. Our mission is very simple. We want to motivate mo millions of people to regenerate biodiversity by planting native plants, by removing invasive plants from our properties, and by reshaping our relationship with, with nature. So these are our existing national parks. We want to turn this into this. Shouldn't be that. Okay, what are we really asking? We really do want people to reduce the area of lawn, long term accomplishing any of the ecological goals that, that our yards need to accomplish. We want to plant more native plants that are accomplishing those goals. We want to remove uh, invasive species, invasive plants in particular. Most people do have invasive plants on their property and they don't even know it. And if you're protecting any natural areas, we want to keep doing that as well. There are real ecological uh, products associated with homegrown national park. Significant increases in biodiversity. And we'll talk about, I'll give you some examples of that in a few minutes. Measurable reduction in invasive species. If everybody got rid of the invasive species just on their property, we'd be 78% done around the entire country. We'd be 85% done in the East. That's a very good first, first step. Significant drawdown of atmospheric, atmospheric CO2. Lawn is the very worst choice in terms of, of sequestering carbon. So if you replant it with anything else, you're going to help climate change. And we're going to build viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. <clears throat> Any bit of conservation we do outside of a park is going to help conservation inside of that park. Uh, there are also real sociological products associated with Homegrown National Park. National awareness, not just of what the problems are, but what the solutions are and what our roles are in those solutions are. We are trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature's not optional. It's not just there for our entertainment. It's essential. It's essential for everybody. And that means everybody owns responsibility to sustaining it. We wanna convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action's even better. And we wanna merge all of the national conservation efforts onto one visual we call the biodiversity map. Merge Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild One, Sierra Club, all the land conservancies. A lot of great conservation going out there on private properties, but nobody's measuring it in one place. So if we're going to take areas like this and convert them into that, uh, if we're, we've got to take areas like this and convert it into that. It's simply a matter of putting the plants back. Homegrown National Park's free. It's entirely supported by, by your generosity. So whether or not we exist in the future will depend on your generosity. There's urgency to enacting the Homegrown National Park solution. Remember that 135 million acres of residential landscape? That's a big job. So we all need to get to work, but we have to understand what it is we need to do to succeed. There are four things that every 
property needs to do if we're going to achieve uh, uh, any kind of sustainable relationship with Mother Nature. Every property has to support a viable food web. Every property has to, has to capture carbon and store it in the plants and in the soil of that property. Every property has to manage the watershed in which it lies. This is one of my neighbor's uh, houses there. It's destroying my, my watershed. He doesn't know that, but he really is. And, and he really doesn't have the ethical right to do that. And finally, every property has to support pollinators. Lawn does none of those things, which is why we focus on that first. We've got to reduce the area in lawn. We also have to choose our plants wide, wisely. This is burning bush, of course, a major invasive species because how we choose our plants is going to determine whether we have that viable food web we were talking about. There are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to the local food web. Remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food through photosynthesis. If they don't pass it on to, to animals, then they're not contributing that energy uh, and you don't have a viable food web. So there's plants that do that well, there's plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and there's plants that actively remove energy from local food webs. The very best contributor around the country in 84% of the counties in which it occurs is one of the oaks. Oaks are contributing more energy to local food webs than any other type of plant. A good example of a, of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia, it's a good ornamental plant, nice, nice fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding energy to the local food web. <clears throat> and a good example of a detractor would be any of the invasive ornamentals from uh, typically from Asia. This is bamboo um, that not only are they not passing on any energy uh, to the food web, but they also escape and push out native plants that are uh, uh, passing on that food. We need a new appreci appreciation of how important caterpillars are to local food webs. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're gonna have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And that's why keystone plants are so important because they are supporting the most caterpillar species. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses. That's because they are the ones making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold that house up. They are the support system. They're essential. We cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do with our, our pretty ornamental plants for the last century. How do you know what the best plants are where you live? You go to Keys, do, uh, Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website. Put in your zip code and the ranked woody plants and herbaceous plants that are best in your county will pop up. Now, the lists are much bigger than this. Uh, but the old excuse of, of we don't know what's a plant, what's going to be very productive, that's just an excuse now. This website tells us exactly what we should be planning. Uh, we have to appreciate that most of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Uh, they can only eat plants for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to get around the defenses that plants use to protect themselves. I'm gonna use the monarch butterfly as an example because we all know the monarch butterfly and we all know it's a, it's a host plant specialist on milkweed. So you can have all the burning bush and all the barberry and all the, the privets and all of the hostas and, and um, all of the Asian plants we typically landscape with in our yard and you won't support a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's gonna support a monarch butterfly is one of our milkweeds. But milkweeds are toxic plants. They are loaded with cardiac glycosides. So if we eat milkweeds, if you eat enough of them, it will stop your heart. That's what cardiac glycosides do. They also have sticky latex sap in them. Um, and that's of course, when you break open the, the vein of the leaf there, we broke it over, all this white goo comes out. When it's exposed to air, it, it turns into a chewing gum like substance. So if a caterpillar gets this on its mouth parts, it ends up gluing the mouth part shut and the caterpillar starves to death. Well, monarch caterpillars do eat milkweed. So how do they get around? 
that that uh, sticky latex sat. You can watch this if you have milkweeds at home. The monarch caterpillar will crawl onto the leaf and the first thing it does is go to the end of the leaf and it starts to eat. Uh, and if any little latex sap starts to come out, it'll stop immediately, turn around, crawl back up the leaf about two thirds of the way, and then it starts to chew through the midrib. And it chews and it chews until it is completely chewed through the midrib of that leaf, which blocks the flow of the latex sap from this end of the leaf to this end of the leaf. Then it turns around, goes back down, and it can eat the leaf without any latex sap coming out at all. That's a behavioral adaptation that very effectively protects this caterpillar from that sticky latex sap. It's also a handy way to find uh, monarch caterpillars, by the way, because it flags the leaf typically. So if you drive down the road and you look at a milkweed patch and you see flag leaves, you know that monarchs are there. Uh, so those are the upsides of specialization. The monarch has the physiological adaptations, the specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify the cardiac glycosides of milkweeds. And they've got the behavioral adaptations that, that uh, minimize their exposure to those nasty compounds. The downside of specialization is that now that's all, all monarchs can eat. They are locked into eating milkweeds. So if you take the milkweeds away from your property and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not going to start to make a living on the hostas. Has two choices then, fly away and find milkweeds someplace else or starve to death. Out of the 2,137 plant genera that are native to North America, monarchs can only eat one, which means we need milkweeds. The point I want to make here is that monarchs are not special. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists, just like monarchs. They need the plants they have specialized on. And if we take them away by landscaping with other plants, we lose those insects. What happens when we, when we take away those native plants and replace them with non-native plants? What happens to the caterpillars that are running those food webs? Well, this is just one study that uh, my students and I have done. Very simple one. We went into hedgerows in Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania uh, that were invaded by non-native plants. So this is full of autumn olive, and multiflora rose, and oriental bittersweet, and bush honeysuckle, and all those guys. And compared caterpillar populations to hedgerows, those that are found in hedgerows that are not invaded with invasive plants. And we found when the hedgerows are invaded, they reduce caterpillar use by 60, well, they re reduce the number of species by 68%. They reduce the abundance of those <sighs> caterpillars by 91%. And they reduce the biomass, the actual amount of energy those caterpillars are providing by 96%. If you think of those caterpillars as bird food, we've reduced the amount of bird food by 96% when we allow these non-native plants to take over. We have to listen very carefully to what E.O. Wilson told us. Uh, he was, you know, a brilliant mind, the most famous professor Harvard has ever produced, in my opinion. One of the things he said, was insects are the little things that run the world. And <clears throat> that means life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, and our mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi and humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. So you might ask yourself, why then do we have National Insect Killing Week? Now, this was 1929, but it was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals, all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects, not just pests, but all insects. Now we don't do that anymore. But actually, we do do that. I mean, we still have this, this um, cultural hatred of insects. If it's an insect out there, we've got to kill it. Uh, well, that has come back to bite us with our pollinators. And we're starting to recognize that now. Uh, pollinators are essential and people are concerned about it. So we do have pollinator pathways and other, other things. Uh, but we need pollinators everywhere, not just in agriculture. You know, the media will say we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's actually about a 12th of our crops. And I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators everywhere because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Losing our pollinators is not an option. We also have to appreciate how important leaves are. Those leaves that fall from our trees, we call them leaf litter. 
Gene Ponzi at, at, uh, in St. Louis thinks we should call them leaf largesse because they do such important things. Um, first, first thing they do is form a blanket over our soil community. You know, there are more species that live in the soil than above the soil, and those species are essential to healthy plant growth. These leaves contain the nutrients that our plants use the year before. Uh, but those nutrients have to be released from the leaf into the soil, then pass from the soil to the, the tree roots by mycorrhizal uh, fungi associations. All of the creatures that break down the leaves and pass on the, those nutrients require high humidity. So the, the blanket that leaf litter forms over the soil is, is protecting the soil moisture. It's pre preventing erosion. It's preventing the, the sun from baking the soil. It's preserving uh, the diversity of that soil community, extremely vital uh, job. But what do we tend to do? We tend to, to rake them away and, and throw them, at, you know, put them out by the curb as if they're, they're litter. And then we go and buy mulch, which is not nearly as good as, as these guys. Now, one of the things that we worry about is if we have leaf litter in our, our uh, garden beds, that our plants, our pretty plants won't be able to grow up through them. Well, who was raking the leaves before we came along? And the plants were there. They grew, grew up through them. Our plants are very good at getting through normal layers of leaf litter. If you pile it five feet thick, yes, they won't be able to get through. But normal layers are not going to deter the plant growth that we want in our beds. This is uh, white snake root at, at uh, our house here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a shingle oak tree. There's lots of leaves here on the ground. I didn't rake any of the leaves away and I didn't plant any of these plants either. It forms a very healthy community. Keep in mind that the, the um, ground covers that we're talking about here don't have to be just two inches high. This white snake root's three or four feet high and it forms a great ground cover. We also have to understand how, how harmful light pollution is. Light pollution kills insects. Light pollution uses a ton of energy, which is all going straight up into space. Um, these are all the ways that, that light pollution is killing our insects, particularly the moths that make the caterpillars that run our food webs. But to me, this is, a, this, is, this is good news actually, because we have got to stop insect declines on this planet. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects. Uh, if we can stop that and turn it around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There are a lot of switches to flick, but there's a lot of us to flick those switches. And somebody's going to say, well, I can't turn the, the light out over my barn or over my garage or over my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to notice is the bad man does not come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. This is the easiest thing to do. You can now buy these bulbs at, at the hardware store. They're called bug, bug lights. It sounds like they're going to kill the bugs, but they don't. Um, they simply do not attract insects. Yellow wavelengths don't attract nocturnal insects, and that's the key. If we were to switch out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would, we would save millions of insects. And if we used LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. Then we've got mosquito fogging. We invite the mosquito fogger to come and kill all the insects on our, our property. It's a booming business around the country. Uh, now, the mosquito foggers say, it's okay, because what we're fogging is a natural product. It's an organic product, and they are correct. It's pyrethroids. It's made by chrysanthemums, so it's natural. It's organic because it's made by a plant. But cyanide is a natural organic product. Ricin is a natural organic product. Nicotine is a natural organic product. Being a natural organic does not mean it's not toxic. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. Not even close to being true. This is the result of a mosquito fogging event on Kent Island in the, the Chesapeake <clears throat> a few years ago. My friend was down there and uh, he picked up that handful of dead monarchs, but there were thousands of dead monarchs because they, they fogged right in the middle of a migration event. So the fogging is killing uh, the pollinators that we're trying to save. It's killing the monarchs, which is now red listed. And it doesn't control mosquitoes, believe it or not. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. You have to kill 90% of them to get good control. Um, these guys kill between 10 and 50%. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. And homeowners can do it. You get a bucket, you fill it full of water, you put in a handful of straw or hay, 
put it out in the sun for a few days, and that builds up the populations of diatoms and algae, which is the, that's exactly what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to any female mosquito that wants to lay her eggs in your yard. So uh, they will lay their eggs in your yard preferentially. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks. That's Bacillus thuringiensis, a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic dipter. It's a cheap, costs $12 for a season's worth of control. You put in a mosquito dunk, it'll kill the mosquito larvae because the only thing that Bacillus thuringiensis kills is aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. It's cheap, it's targeted, and if everybody did it, it would work. We want to appreciate how important uh, conservation can be on small properties. Uh, this is Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. It's only one-tenth of an acre, not connected to any natural area at all. She's right next to O'Hare Airport, uh, and she's recorded 125 species of birds that use her property. This is an all-native planting, by the way. So if you're wondering whether you can use native plants attractively, you can. And of course, if you have no property at all, we can use container gardening. Uh, it's actually a very powerful tool for city dwellers, uh, but it's underutilized. You know, picture a typical apartment complex like this. Look at all these balconies. If all of them were loaded with uh, with container plantings, um, it would become, you know, to, a, to a, a, a monarch or a bee, it would look like a giant rock outcrop with an awful lot of plants on them and they would use it. They're highly mobile insects. So what native plants are best for containers? Well, again, go to our, our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. And this is the, the uh, section on that website dedicated to container gardening. It will tell you what the best native plants are for containers in your part of the country. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and biodiversity, two crises that we can solve or at least help uh, using the same approach. And that is that conservation works. This is the Natusa grasslands in Illinois. It's 3,800 acres, 730 native plant species there now, 180 species of birds use this. It used to be a cornfield. Point is nature's resilient. It will come back if we put the plants back that it is comprised of. This is what our house looked like when, when Cindy and I moved in, in the year 2000. It was an old farm that had been farmed for uh, almost 300 years. The last thing they did was mow it for hay. When you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, where we live, you're really mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive plants, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and autumn olive and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle. And when you stop mowing, that's what, what comes back. There are all these plants from Asia. So when we actually moved in, we had 10 acres of this. So step one in a restoration, of course, is to get rid of those non-native plants that are not supporting the food web. It's a big job but it's not as hard as you might think. You just get your wife to do it. <laughs> and when she's finished, you can start putting the plants back. Um, and this is a picture taken from pretty much the same, same perspective as that, that first picture. Now, my research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths that are in your local food web, moths, not butterflies. Butterflies are bad tasting day flying moths. So they're not an important part of the food web, believe it or not. But if you know the number of species of moths making all those caterpillars, you have a very good index of how stable your food web is and how productive it is. In other words, how many species it's supporting. So I have been taking a picture of the number of species or every species of moth I, I have been able to find on our property for the last six years. And I'm still at it, haven't finished yet, but I'm up to 1,259. Okay, so um, I could come meet you now. Okay, we're going to mute, mute again. All right, that's a lot of species that have come back because we put the plants back on our property. Now, we've got 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 29.4 million acres. So on one 2.29 millionth of the, the land mass, we've got 48% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And many of these are really cool looking things like the chinkaping leaf miner, the skullcap skeletonizer, the neighbor, they've got great names, the little devil, the horrid zaley, the forgotten frigid owlet, a great name, the visitation moth, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, and yes, there's the implicit arches, the snowy shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the morbid owlet, the pink shaded fern moth, the feeble grass moth, the scribbler, 
the Lemon Plagotis, the Cynical Quaker, the Showy Emerald, the Green Marvel, Harris's Three Spot, the Old Wife Underwing, the Eyed Pectes, the Hog Sphinx, the Tufted Bird Dropping Moth. Who wouldn't want the Tufted Bird Dropping Moth at their house? And of course, the spun glass caterpillar, that's my favorite. And hundreds of other species have come to uh, our, our property to make a living because we put their plants back. And the first thing people ask is, well, how come they're not eating all your plants? How can you have any plants at all? Uh, and I guess it's a good question. The answer is so many things eat these caterpillars to keep them in check. How about those birds? We've recorded 62 species of birds that breed on our property and they breed because we've got all those caterpillars that they're feeding their young. Each bird that had with a nest is eating hundreds of caterpillars every single day. It's amazing I can find any caterpillars at our house. We also have uh, predators, insect predators like ambush bugs, like assassin bugs, like the, the uh, predatory stink bug that sat next to this, this aggregation of uh, milkweed tussock moths and ate one every time it got hungry. That was a smaller aggregation when he got through. A lot of hymenopteran parasitoids that are laying their eggs in those caterpillars. We've got wasps that are stinging the caterpillars and, and sterilizing them. Then they carry them off, put them in their mud nests and lay an egg on them. This is nature's form of refrigeration. If they killed the caterpillar and carried it off and laid an egg on it, it would rot before the egg even hatched. But when they paralyze the caterpillar, it doesn't rot. It's, it's alive, but uh, they lay the egg, the egg hatches and the egg has something fresh to eat. Got a lot of vertebrates out there eating insects as well. Uh, we've got a few skunks. We've got possums. We've got raccoons. We've got foxes. 25% of a fox's diet is insects. And we've got amphibians. We've got uh, tree, what is this? A spring peeper, spring peepers. We've got uh, toads. We've got salamanders. We've got ring neck snakes. These are all insectivores. And we've got the cutest little gray tree frogs that are actually green when they're young. So all those things are keeping our, our landscape in balance and we've got plenty of plants. Now there's something common to each one of these conservation approaches and that is whether or not they succeed depends on the decisions that you and I make. Uh, Amanda Crandall, this was a student in one of my classes a few years ago. She was answering a final exam and this was part of her answer. While conservation is claimed to be managing species and habitats, what we're actually managing is people. So we're really talking about a sociological problem here. We need to change our adversarial relationship with nature to a collaborative one. It's the only path forward. And the question is, can we do this? Well, I think we can. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. More and more people recognize that the earth has some real challenges these days, but it's easy to feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can modify the lights, one person can add a pollinator garden, one person can remove invasive plants, one person can use keystone plants, one person can fire your mosquito fogger, one person can join Homegrown National Park, a whole bunch of things one person can do to revitalize uh, the, the little ecosystem on their property and then enhance their greater local ecosystem instead of continuing to degrade it. Important thing is that it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They are all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So we hope that Homegrown National Park will provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of people to tackle these conservation challenges. Uh, because whether or not we do that now is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. Ultimately our own. Now I want to leave you with Homegrown National Park Challenge. I want each one of you, I'm asking each one of you to plant one keystone plant this year. I don't care where you plant it, but plant one keystone plant this year. It will take you five minutes. You might think, well, that's not going to help very much. But I'm actually asking 400,000 of you to do that. So it will add up. Thanks very much. That's all I have.